So please help me welcome to the stage, Masha Gessen. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. So um, I, uh, it's been odd for me uh, to suddenly find myself, uh, I've been back in this country for three and a half years, and you know, about a year ago, I suddenly realized that I had directly transferable skills after more than 20 years of reporting on Russia, which is uh, not something I expected, nor something I particularly welcomed. Um, but I have, tr I have tried to use them. So what I'm going to do with my short presentation now is, um, um, is run through some points of similarity between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. And I want to make clear why I'm doing that. I'm not doing that to prove some sort of connection between them because actually I don't find the, you know, the, the, the endless conspiracy uh, search for the uh, trying to prove that Trump is a Putin puppet particularly constructive, and um, maybe we can discuss it further in the, in the discussion why I don't think it's particularly constructive. But um, that's not my point. Nor is it my point that they are so incredibly similar. They're actually very different in some key ways, right? One of them, uh, and you know which one, communicates in raw emotion. The other one is extremely controlled. In fact, he prides himself in never expressing emotion. They inherited vastly different uh, historical legacies and political cultures. But because I spent so much time reporting on Putin, I think I developed a kind of optics that actually, I'm not the only person with those kinds of optics. Um, the great journalist Alexander Steele, who spent many years reporting on Berlusconi, also has something like that, right? When you, when you cover um, an, uh, an autocrat, you learn to see certain things that may not jump out at someone else, but do very much jump out at me. So that's what I'm going to point out to you, the, um, the, kinds, of, uh, the kinds of things that I think are very important in how Donald Trump acts that are in some uh, ways instructive. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, so this is basically going to be just a list. Right? So I have nine points. Uh, point number one is the way they lie, because the way they lie, as you know by now, is not the way most politicians lie, right? They don't lie in order to try to convince you of something. They lie in order to assert power, right? The message that Donald Trump sends when he says that millions of people voted illegally, or when he says that he was wiretapped, or when he says that he had the biggest inauguration, is basically a bully message. It's a message that says, I have the right to say whatever I want, whenever I want, right? And that's different than the way most people and most politicians lie, and that means we have to handle it differently, and it also means, unfortunately, that fact-checking is not a very effective way of, of confronting it. Right, point number two of similarity is that they govern by gesture, right? It's something huge. It's a, it's a way of promoting the brand. It's not something that will actually be continued. It's not part of a strategy. And that makes it difficult for us to analyze because we're used to thinking of politics as being continuous. Whereas this is spurts, right? He brought back the carrier jobs. Not exactly, and not a lot of jobs, and, um, uh, and you know, it's not scalable, he bribed and blackmailed Carrier into doing that, but still, to him, that's an accomplishment because it's an effective gesture. Again, that's, that's important to understand so that we can understand how, um, you know, how, how this works out and how this continues. It continues in, 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 a, in a sort of uh, 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 you know, chain of disconnected gestures. And connected to that, they have interests rather than priorities, right? Again, we're used to analyzing uh, politicians from the point of view of policies, right? What is he building? What is he trying to get at? But that's not what's happening here. Uh, he has broad interests. He's broadly interested in, in fighting immigration. He's broadly interested in defense. In fact, he thinks that that's what government is, is just you know, raw power. 
That's what he's interested in. He's actually also interested in destruction, right? And that brings me to my fourth point of similarity, which is that they both have disdain for government. This is something that connects uh, Trump to Putin, but also to many autocrats, both in recent memory and not so recent memory, right? Uh, they think that government as it's constituted is rotten to the core, needs to be dismantled, needs to be destroyed. They blame it for everything that happened. You know, his, uh, his, um, uh, his, his tendency to blame his predecessor for everything. It's a little bigger than blaming the predecessor. It's blaming the whole system that he is here to destroy, right? And when he was talking about draining the swamp, he wasn't talking about making the institutions work better. He was talking about his perception that that shouldn't exist, which is why, of course, every person uh, who's appointed to run an agency uh, is actually opposed to the mission of that agency. That's the idea. That's a feature, not, not a bug. It's also why Trump continues to campaign and continues to campaign against the government. It might seem insane that he is running the government and also campaigning against the government, but it's actually quite consistent and his uh, no, no longer friend, but someone he admires, Vladimir Putin, has done this very effectively for 17 years, right? This actually works. This is believable to his base. Um, another disdain point, he has a disdain for the public sphere. He thinks protesters are paid. He thinks that, um, that rallies need to stop because the election is over. Remember he said that about the women's march. Uh, he, uh, he basically thinks that anything that is not transactional should not exist. Right? He perceive it, perceives it as an attack on his legitimacy. He also has uh, disdain for the media and he views the media as a mirror. Right? In order for Putin to be able to, uh, to use the media as his mirror, he had to take over the media. It took him a year to take over broadcast television in Russia. And now for 16 years, Russians have only been watching Putin TV. The problem though, is that Putin has been watching Putin TV for 16 years. And that has created a separate reality for him. You might remember that after he invaded Ukraine, the German chancellor Angela Merkel called him and then said he lives in his own reality. And a lot of people thought that, he was, that she was saying that he was crazy, which isn't what she was saying. She was saying he lives in a reality of his own making, and he is impervious to information that comes out of other realities. Now, Trump has invented a really novel way of doing that. He hasn't taken over the media. He just found the bubble that he wants to live in, right? His bubble is Breitbart. One of my favorite stories from the election season, one of the, I think, the most instructive and inspired stories was one that wasn't that difficult to do, but was brilliant to conceive. BuzzFeed did a, an analysis of Trump's tweets over the course of 18 months, right? And realized, or concluded, that uh, Trump, th Trump's, nearly his sole source of information is Breitbart, right? So he is already inside that dictator's bubble that many dictators took ma take many years to get to. And he, he's going to live in it and he's going to insist that nothing is outside that bubble exists. That actually, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's important to understand. It's also important to understand that there's a difference between bubble, which Breitbart is, and you know, not being closely connected to people with, different, with vastly different views from your own. Specifically what I mean is that you know, we've started to say, oh, we have a left-wing bubble and a right-wing bubble. This is a false equivalence. That is actually not true. From what we know, and we know a fair amount about the way that information moves, there is a fairly healthy public sphere, not perfect, but healthy, from about the center right to about the center left, right, where people are routinely exposed to opinions that they don't share, and where they get answers to questions that they didn't ask. That is how the public sphere should work. And it is working, right? Breitbart is a bubble. People who read Breitbart and some smaller satellites are never exposed to opinions that they don't share, don't actually get answers to questions that they didn't ask. That is a bubble. Those are two different things. We shouldn't you know, be beating ourselves in the chest and saying we live in a bubble because we don't, right? We actually should be looking at what we have and saying this needs to be protected. The public sphere is under attack. And it is precious. 
and we need to reinvigorate it and protect it. Two more points of, thank you. Two, two more points that begin with the word disdain. Uh, Trump has a disdain for moral authority because moral authority, individual moral authority, is what threatens autocrats most. It's something that they can't capture. You can't buy it, you can't, lay claim, you can't you know, take it by force, you can't lay claim to it by title. You have either, either earned it or not. If you think back to the great liberation movements, they've always had a person of moral authority or several people of moral authority as you know, their organizing foc point of focus. Representative John Lewis is somebody who's an, an, who has a moral authority in this country. And it's very easy to see how that works, right? He said he wasn't going to attend the inauguration. 59 other members of Congress said they weren't going to attend the inauguration either. That's how moral authority works. It, works, uh, it can organize by speaking, right? That's why it scares Trump so much, and that's why he went after Representative Lewis with such persistence. I mean, for three days he was tweeting about him when normally his attention span would long since, long since have ended. But it's frightening to him. He also has disdain for excellence. Right? One of the things that's happening, and this is very common among autocrats, you know, why should anything be original? Why should anyone be an expert? And I think that this is, this is an important point also because a lot of people have been looking at the first 100 days and saying, oh, okay, well maybe this is not so scary. He's just plain incompetent. Um, he's not a fascist, he's just plain incompetent. That's a false opposition. Actually, those two go together. A basic disdain for, for excellence, a basic lack of understanding of how government works, of how much expertise is needed to keep this running, uh, is a very important part of trying to regress to autocracy. And then my final point of similarity is that both Trump and Putin and, uh, and many other autocrats through history think that they're the chosen ones. And if you look at them, you think, you know, they were unqualified for the job. Uh, Putin was plucked out of obscurity, uh, and he had never wanted to be president. He's grown to like it. But um, Trump, from every indication, didn't expect to win the election. It was almost a fluke that he even ran. But instead of being humbled by the circumstance of being accidental, he comes to believe that he has a mission. There's something special. Because humans don't actually believe in accidents. We always believe that something happened for a reason. So there must be a reason he ended up being president. What that means for us is that there's a real blurring, but for people like that who think that, there's, um, that they have a mission and that they, they're chosen to do this job, it tends to blur the boundaries between his individuality and the government, between the government and the state and the state and the country. And so when they are criticized, they actually sincerely believe that they're being criticized by enemies of the people, which is an expression that Trump has already taken to and he's only been in office for 100 days. And I will stop there. I hope this has laid the groundwork for a conversation with uh, another expert on, this, uh, on the same sort of thing. Sorry, Kenzo. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to introduce you to Sarah Kenzior, who is an op-ed columnist for The Globe and Mail and the U.S. correspondent to the Dutch news outlet, De Correspondent. Her April 2013 Al Jazeera English article, The Wrong Kind of Caucasian, is the most popular Al Jazeera op-ed of all time. And her essay collection, The View from Flyover Country, was published in 2015. Her articles have appeared in Politico, The Guardian, Quartz, Slate, The Atlantic, Medium, The New York Times, and others. And she's been a guest on NPR, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, BBC World Service, Fox, and other broadcast outlets. In August of 2013, Foreign Policy named her one of the 100 people you should be following on Twitter to make sense of global events. Today, the conversation will be about in defense of the truth. Opening remarks, of course, were made by Masha, 
and now you have been introduced to Sarah. So please welcome them both. Hi, everybody. Um, one thing that was left out of that rather extensive bio um, is that I'm an anthropologist and I began my career studying authoritarian states in Central Asia. Um, in particular, I studied Uzbekistan. And a lot of people are kind of like, you know, what are you going to do with that? And much like Masha, <laughs> I unfortunately found the answer in the last year um, with the similarities between Uzbekistan's form of governance um, and their dictator and their dictator's daughter or former dictator and dictator's daughter and Trump uh, and his family. So I could relate a lot uh, to everything you were saying in your presentation, Masha. I thought it was excellent. Um, I hope that people in the audience understand uh, you know, where she was coming from um, and pick up on that. Um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to be on a panel with you because I thought that you wrote one of just the best articles uh, immediately in the aftermath of the election when people were really scrambling in the US uh, to make sense of the situation because it was unfamiliar for them. Um, <laughs> that article was called um, Autocracy Rules for Survival. Um, and in it, you warned about the dangers of normalizing Donald Trump and gave strategies on how to resist him. And I was curious how you felt a uh, hundred days in to this wonderful administration. Um, has he been normalized? Uh, if he has, who has enabled it? Um, and do you think that this will continue in the future um, if you do think that this has in fact occurred? Yeah. You know, I think there there have been, and I, I really want to know what, what you think, because obviously you've been thinking about the same stuff, but uh, I, I think that there have been parallel competing tracks. There's been the normalization track, uh, and it's driven by perfectly understandable impulses, you know, especially in the media. I mean, uh, first of all, there's this uh, phenomenon, and I'm very familiar with it, when you wake up in the morning and you're like, okay, you're still a person in the world, mm -hmm. and the sun has still come up, and well, maybe it's not so bad. You know, the nuclear holocaust hasn't happened yet. yet. Uh, irreversible, irreversible change to to the planet is um, is not immediately observable. Maybe on this morning, and um, and maybe you've just been hysterical, right? And you, I mean, we don't have tools for for just being uh, in a state of outrage the entire time. It's probably not terribly healthy to be in a, in a state of outrage the entire time. But we also don't have the words to describe something that is both ongoing and not normal, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we, we adapt and we, we normalize. So I think that's been happening a lot in the media. And one I think of the effects of it has been that the center has been perceptibly shifting, right? I found myself, for example, um, the New York Times did this, this um, piece called Partisan Writing You Shouldn't Miss. And the continuum on it was from Ann Coulter to me. And, you know, okay, so that means Donald Trump is at the center, right? That's, that's how they position the political center. And with a normal president, that would be normal. You know, you'd look to the right and to the left and say, okay, this is, um, this is how it works. But this isn't normal. And so positioning him in the center is a part of normalizing. So that, you know, I think that's been happening. On the other hand, we've seen a lot of protests. We, we've seen people who are really managing to maintain uh, you know, outrage and, 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 and continue to react. There, uh, I mean, the, 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 the reaction to the travel bans, the LC, ACLU has just been relentless. I think there's also been a lot of amazing stuff in the media of, you know, that, of people who absolutely refuse to normalize and who actually are actively looking for ways to cover Trump that are different than the ways of covering other presidencies, which is really the most important thing. What do you think? Um, no, I, I agree with that. You know, one thing I think that's happened is that people, um, you know, it's like you were saying, if you describe what's actually happening, if you lay out these policies in the most you know, blunt of terms. He's trying to ban Muslims. He's trying to build a wall. The exact policies he ran on, which should not surprise anybody, uh, you're often taken as somebody who's exaggerating, who's pessimistic, who's looking at a worst case scenario. Um, but what's been most useful is to, you know, accept him in these cases at his word. He actually is as bad as he says. In terms of the composition of his administration, um, he's done exactly what you would think he would do. You know, he likes to divide people between haters and losers, and I think that's 
actually an apt way to describe the administration. On the hater side, you know, you have people like Bannon or Seb Gorka. Um, you have people in the background like Paul Manafort. On the loser side, as Masha pointed out earlier, you have people who were chosen for their incompetence. This is a purposeful incompetence, and they're meant to dismantle the departments that they're in charge of. And this is kind of a mind-blowing thing. And so I think the temptation for the US media is to try to normalize this. And one way they do this is by every now and again uh, deeming him presidential. Uh, this happened twice uh, in a significant way. The first time was in a speech to Congress where he managed to disprove the rumor that he couldn't read uh, and also didn't say anything egregiously racist. Uh, so suddenly he was presidential and you know he blew that the next day because Jeff Sessions was called into the Russian investigation and then the tide turned. The second time, which is much more disturbing for me, he bombed Syria and that became um, a sign of his presidential aptitude and he was, he was cheered for it and went on to bomb Afghanistan and went on to antagonize uh, North Korea. Um, and so I think that's one set of fantasies. Another one I'm curious on your opinion on is this sort of belief that a lot of Americans have expressed that somehow the so-called deep state is going to come and rescue us from this situation. Um, because there is an ongoing investigation into Russian interference. It's backed by 17 intelligence agencies. There's a long trail of evidence uh, linking a lot of Trump's team uh, to Russia, to WikiLeaks, to Putin. Um, but it's moving very slowly. It's really not, you know, carrying along. And I think a lot of people, in not wanting to cope with the reality of our situation, look to that as kind of an out. And I was just curious what your opinions were on that investigation, because I know at, at some point, you know, you thought it was um, a little overwrought, so that there's conspiracy theories. But at other times, like in the article I mentioned before, you talked about it, it's good to be the hysteric in the room, that even if people think you know, you're crazy, even if people think you're off track, it's important to pursue uh, the truth despite the prospect of mockery or dismissal. So what's the line between alarmism and being rightfully alarmed in this scenario? Well, the line lies along this, uh, the, the, the line of conspiracy thinking, which I think is always harmful. It's particularly harmful right now because Trump is a conspiracist. He has brought uh, into government a whole bunch of conspiracies. There is a huge temptation to respond to him by also becoming conspiracy thinkers. And this is something that, uh, you know, th that is obser an observable phenomenon in all sorts of autocracies. In fact, uh, you know, the, the Victor Klemperer, who is a wonderful diarist of the Hitler years, writes about the, that, the rise of conspiracy thinking on both sides in his diaries of 1940. That's what we're, I think, observing with Russia. The, how can you tell uh, when something is a conspiracy theory? Well, um, first of all, there's a difference between truth and secret, right? Truth can be observed, evidenced, discussed, engaged with. Secrets can only be revealed. That's what we're looking to the Russia investigation to do. We're looking for it to reveal the deep secret behind the Trump presidency. It's also just too perfect. You know, it works backwards and it works forwards. Backwards, it explains how we got Trump. The Russians did it. Forwards, it explains how we're going to get rid of Trump because it's all going to come to light and he's going to get impeached. Actually, Americans voted for Trump. That's how we got Trump, right? Uh, and the Russia conspiracy keeps us from engaging with that plain fact, which is very uncomfortable and very scary. Um, even the investigative agency's uh, theory on how the Russians gave us Trump says that. You know, they said, well, they manipulated information in the open. You know, they influenced voters. Influencing voters is not illegal, right? Uh, that's what people do. That's what the public sphere is for. I, you know, I have no respect for the Russian propaganda organs that did it, but there's, it's sinister, but it's not illegal. And the sort of the standard for, of proof that we would have to apply to this is extraordinarily high. They would actually have, the investigation would actually have to prove that there was collusion. I think what it said, I mean, first of all, it's going to take a long time. And, uh, you know, do you remember, remember Iran Contra? Do you remember how long that took? And do you remember how it had no political consequences? This is what we're looking at, right? This is going to take a long time, and I think what it's going to produce in the end is a lot of loose ends, a lot of contacts, no clear transactions. 
and so it's not going to have political consequences, except that it will have sapped a lot of energy that should really be applied out in the open. I both agree and I disagree with that. I think that there are harder, more concrete ties um, than you're letting on. I agree with you that propaganda has been overemphasized because every state uses propaganda and people intervene in elections that way all the time. But I think something like Flynn being a foreign agent, Manafort being a foreign agent, Trump's 30 or 40 years of financial ties with Russia, the fact that we don't know his wealth, the fact that we don't know his debt, but we do know he's been hanging out with a lot of oligarchs and involved in a lot of transactions he doesn't want to talk about. The fact that they're trying to cover it up, that so many people from Sessions to Nunes to others in the administration don't want an investigation, makes me feel that they have something to hide. However, I agree that as this goes on, and I think you're right that it's going to go on for a very long time, we need to look um, at the fundamental changes in American society that Trump is causing. We need to look at the other reasons uh, that he won. I think that Russian interference was one factor out of many factors. In terms of the legality of the election, I'd also just look at basic racist voter suppression, uh, which was a huge factor, particularly in the Midwest. Um, I'd look at shifts in political culture, at white supremacy, at the media, and for, I mean, you can just you know go on and on. But one thing I was interested in talking to you about, because you know, you've seen this um, in Russia, and I've seen it in Uzbekistan, is this idea of the truth um, and how to ascertain it in a society that becomes more and more conspiracy oriented, more and more paranoid. Because in my experience with Uzbekistan, I've found that after so many years of not being able to trust the information you receive, whether from the government or from the media or from your neighbors, the result of that kind of ubiquitous paranoia isn't disbelief, but credulity. It's accepting almost everything. And I was wondering if you had any advice, uh, having seen this in Russia for so many years, of how uh, we in America can cope in this kind of information environment. Yeah, well, I, you know, I love these questions, and I'm sure you do too, because it's like, uh, there's this assumption that after having participated or observed a lot of failure, you suddenly know how to prevent it. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've obviously uh, had such a successful experience resisting it in Russia that I'm here now. Uh, and uh, like a lot of Russian dissidents. So, so I don't think there's a recipe for success. I do think that, um, and you know, I mean more broadly, we never know what the right thing to do is, right? We know what the wrong thing to do is. What the wrong thing to do is, is to be tolerant of, uh, of squishy reality, to sort of, to, to allow yourself to get accustomed to it, and also to be tolerant of squishy language. Because language is the only thing that we have for protecting truth, right? Uh, and for communicating that we all have a shared reality. I mean, our conversations express a commitment to understanding a shared reality. That is not Donald Trump's commitment, right? Uh, and um, I think that we need to really uh, hold ourselves and the media to a higher standard, right? Call lies, lies, right? Do not call them evidence-free assertions. Do not call them, you know, he said this, but there was no evidence. Do not, uh, um, alternative do not, facts. Alter, alternative <laughs> facts, yeah. I mean, but I'm, not, I'm talking about, you know, legacy media. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the NPR rule that they don't actually call Trump's lies lies because they can peer into his soul and see whether he actually intended to lie. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a sort of demagoguery, weirdly, right? Uh, it's just, it's just the, 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 the opposite of Trump, Trump's demagoguery. Um, when somebody lies, you have to call that. When uh, the, the example I used, you know, the, what's such an innocuous word is partisan. Well, partisan means something. Partisan means belonging to a party, right? So when th something is, you think, very politically marked, but it doesn't actually belong to a party, it's not partisan. You know, it's something else, right? Um, the more precise we are with language, the better I think our chances are of, of holding on to reality. That's, that's, I mean, that's my only uh, recipe and I've never seen it succeed. Do you have a, 
Do you have a recipe? I, honestly, um, <laughs> we've got 50, 50 seconds. I, I don't have a recipe for that. I encourage you all to strive for it. But I think that um, the internet is actually making this situation uh, much worse than it was originally. I think there's ample uh, room for misinterpreting things, for lies, for propaganda, uh, for you know manipulating content. And you know that worries me as well. And you know that basically could be a, its own panel. Uh, we got 25 seconds. Would you like the final word on that? On the internet, we have Merriam-Webster, <laughs> the best presence on social media. I urge you to follow it. You know, I think that they have been throwing up definitions of words is actually brilliant, and people have been talking about it as trolling Trump. But I think you know, what they're demonstrating over and over again is a commitment to reality, a commitment to precise language. Yeah. All right. You did it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.